Once Around, Janus and Epimetheus. These are moons of Saturn. The first discovery is officially the 15th of December 1966 by Dolphus, French astronomer, and there was a pre-covery photograph from earlier that year on the 29th of October uh, by another astronomer that had managed to pick up the same object. At the time, Saturn's rings were edge-on to us, and the image on the right is generated from a planetarium with the date set to the 15th of December 1966, and you can hardly see the rings at all. You can see marked some of the moons, including uh, the ones that we're talking about, Janus, and lurking behind the body of the planet there, Epimetheus, along with two others, Mimas, that had been known for many years, and a smaller one, Prometheus. So the fact that the rings were so completely edge-on to us was the reason that the discovery of Janus was made. Because it orbits just at the edge of the rings, it was almost invisible when the rings were tilted in our direction, but as they are so thin and vanish when we cross the ring plane periodically, as Saturn and Earth orbit round in slightly different orbital planes around the Sun, the angle of Saturn's equator and its rings to us changes and just as I record this video they are edge on to us again. I was looking the other night and you just couldn't see them at all and it's that that enabled observers to actually spot Janus for the first time. It's very very close to the outer edge of the A ring. Sir Patrick Moore in his book, The Amateur Astronomer, from the 1960s and 70s, which I've still got on the shelf here, and he refers to it on page 131, saying that he'd actually observed Janus on at least four different occasions during 1966, but failed to recognise that it was an unknown moon, so he might have actually been able to claim that as a discovery if he'd reported it. And there is the man in an old photograph with his 15-inch uh, reflector in his dome at uh, his home farthings in West Street in Selsey, on the south coast of the UK. Now, three days later, on the 18th of December of that same year, 1966, Richard Walker was observing, and he saw a moon in a very similar ring-edge position and recorded it. Realising that it wasn't any of the known moons, he reported it, and the position was different. It just didn't seem to add up. We seem to have got Janus having been discovered on the 15th and then three days later another moon in a different position but at the same relative distance from Saturn. And as observers were then encouraged to go and confirm these observations making more and more reports the orbit just did not seem to make any sense. It seemed to be flitting about from one observation to another in a rather irregular manner. And this led to a name being coined for the moon, Janus, named after the two-faced Roman god because of this very, very curious behaviour where it kept appearing in the wrong place. And it wasn't until 12 years later, 1978, that Larsen and Fountain solved the problem. They realised that the observations during 1966-67 were in fact of two different objects and could be grouped into two uh, parts, each associated with a different moon, but in very similar orbits. And the names Janus and Epimetheus were coined for these two moons, these co-orbital moons that were in almost identical path around Saturn. The following year, 1st of September 1979, we had the Saturn flyby 
of Pioneer 11 and some images were taken which seemed to possibly reveal a new moon S for Saturn 1979 for the year and 1 an S for satel satellite and this was probably Epimetheus and then Pioneer 11's particle detectors picked up a shadow which they thought was another moon giving it the designation S 1979 S2 and we think that was Janus so it's probable that Pioneer 11 managed to spot both of them. In 1980 Voyager 1 made a flyby just a year behind Pioneer 11 and this time it was on the lookout and it managed to confirm this double moon existence of Janus and Epimetheus during the flyby. Didn't get a particularly close uh, look at either of them. It had to take a path uh, uh, such that it would be able to get a good flyby of Titan and that meant that uh, it really sort of flew past and underneath Saturn and up out of the solar system um, and not able to then carry on on its way to the outer planets but uh, Titan was such an object of interest that uh, it was deemed that to be the right choice and of course it was being followed not far behind by Voyager 2 which was able to get this rather blurry image of Janus from a distance showing a potato shaped moon covered in craters which wasn't really too much of a surprise. Since Voyager 2 we have of course had the Cassini mission and this has been able to image things in much greater uh, resolution with much better cameras and this is Janus f apparently floating against the background of Saturn itself with Saturn's atmosphere in the background there uh, showing that nearly round shape a little bit elliptical and with chunks taken out of it and craters. So physically it's 203 by 185 by 149 kilometers so ellipsoidal in both axes and weighs in at just under 2 times 10 to the 18 kilograms which is uh, not very much the earth is uh, 10 to the 25 kilograms for comparison so this is a fairly small moon really and density is less than that of ice, 0.64 grams per cubic centimetre, suggesting it's a rubble pile with many voids in it, made mostly of icy material, but with a lot of gaps. Somewhat cratered and very shiny looking. It reflects over 70% of the light. Uh, our moon, by comparison, is about 12%, so very dark indeed. So this is much brighter for its size than uh, you would perhaps expect. And that goes with the probability that this is a fairly young surface because bright ice tends to get degraded by solar radiation and turned from a nice crystalline form into an amorphous form which then doesn't scatter the light back anywhere near as well. Epimetheus, named after the son of Iapetus, of course Iapetus is another of Saturn's large moons, brother to Prometheus and Atlas, those are also names of Saturn's moons, um, and it means hindsight from the original Greek. Smaller than Janus, so its uh, long axis is about the same as Janus's short axis, um, and again irregular and somewhat jagged looking, and about a quarter of the mass in total, and again covered in grooves, valleys, craters and so forth, uh, so fairly battered looking, but again quite bright in colour, uh, looking to be similar in age to Janus. Now, Janus's orbit, on average, is just 50 kilometres greater in its uh, semi-major axis than that of Epimetheus. And 50 kilometres is less than the size of the short axis of either of the moons. And so you, you would think that there would be a possibility that these might crash into each other because the orbits really are very similar indeed. But smaller orbits take less time and so 
Epimetheus, left to its own devices, would manage an, a lap of Saturn in just 30 seconds less per orbit than Janus. And an object on a close path, an inner orbit, will take less time to go round than one in a, a further orbit. Um, but these two manage to stay apart. They don't crash into each other because they undergo orbital swapping. I have a diagram here showing Epimetheus on a lower orbit, shorter path around Saturn, and as such taking less time. It will gradually approach from behind and catch up with Janus. Janus with a J, slightly larger in size and mass. Epimetheus approaches it. And as it does so, the gravity of the two moons is pulling on each other and it's accelerating Epimetheus towards Janus and accelerating Janus backwards towards Epimetheus. So Epimetheus speeds up and when you speed up, you end up moving into a higher orbit, a curious quirk of orbital dynamics. Um, obviously, a rocket firing its engines will eventually escape if it's got enough power going to higher and higher orbit as it speeds up until it finally flies away. So if you accelerate Epimetheus, it climbs away from Saturn. In the process, of course, Janus, every action having an equal and opposite reaction, is slowed and slowing down makes you spiral inwards so it falls to a lower orbit. And so they swap positions. Epimetheus ends up in the outer track and Janus on the lower track. Now that they're that way round, Janus's orbit is shorter and therefore it gets to pull away from Epimetheus and the two separate again until gradually Janus goes right round and catches up with Epimetheus and the process reverses. The outer moon is slowed, the inner moon is sped up and climbs away from the planet and they swap back. And so we've got this little animation here of the two of them in these strange orbits. Epimetheus comes round, approaches Janus, they swap, it goes back around the other way and they approach in the opposite sense and swap again. And so they seem to bounce backwards and forwards off each other. Now this animation is from the point of view of somebody uh, rotating around with the average velocity. Um, so you wouldn't get this view from Earth, but you would get this view if you were uh, in the vicinity of Saturn doing an orbit in their typical average time. Uh, so it can be quite confusing. Here's another way of looking at it, again from a rotating frame of reference. Each of the two has these horseshoe orbits, which uh, are sort of these uh, long curved sausage tracks. And you can see that Janus being more massive is affected less by the process. Its uh, orbit is typically 21.6 degrees per hour going around Saturn, if you want to think of it in those terms, um, and it's slowed down very slightly and sped up very slightly by those figures of 0 0.05 degrees a day or uh, plus or minus, whereas the lower mass of Epimetheus means that it, its orbit is changed more radically uh, by a figure of 0 0.19 plus and minus compared to the standard. And so you get these two racetrack patterns that the uh, moons appear to observe. Now, this was figured all figured out by um, Lagrange when he was working out his uh, Lagrange points, the stable regions in the three-body problem. And he was able to figure out that you could follow a path creating a horseshoe shaped orbit as you tracked around the larger of the bodies in a, a three body system. And we see that in the asteroid Cruithne, which orbits around the sun in exactly one year. And the orbit of the two 
bodies, Cruithne and Earth, is shown in the top animation there with the sun in the middle. Cruithne's orbit is more elliptical and offset in a different direction, and so its orbit goes around the sun with close approaches to the Earth on a regular basis. But if you look at it from our perspective, in the bottom diagram, holding the Earth still, then the path of Cruithne seems to be that yellow kidney bean racetrack shape um, where it approaches and moves away from the Earth. And some people have described this as Earth's second moon, but really it's not. It's orbiting the Sun and it's being if affected by the presence of the Earth, but it's not really under the control of the Earth's gravity at all. And this process probably occurred with a body called Thea in the early days of the solar system, a Mars-sized planet formed near one of the Lagrange points of the Earth's orbit, and then that resulted in it wandering back and forth in these horseshoe loops, perturbed by the changing gravity of Jupiter as Jupiter spiralled in. It gradually got into um, wider and wider loops until it finally collided with the Earth, uh, smashed into and merged with it, and a lot of the ejecta from the impact then coalesced to form our Moon, orbiting around the combined body of the proto-Earth and Thea. And as regards Jep Janus and Epimetheus, it's possible that they f were formed by the breakup of a larger moon. These rubble pile objects are not very well held together by the uh, fact that they have very, very weak gravity. And so coming close to a giant planet like Saturn, they can be torn apart. That's how the rings formed. And these are just outside the edge of the A ring and therefore could well be that the remains of a larger moon uh, that were torn to pieces. But they are destined perhaps under the perturbation of the other moons eventually to approach each other more closely. They actually, at the moment, only get within uh, a minimum of 10,000 kilometers of each other before that orbital swap occurs. So they're not going to hit each other at the moment, but at some point in the future, the orbits may get altered to uh, the point where a co another collision might happen, in which case a whole lot of debris will be added to Saturn's rings in all probability. Now there is a faint dust ring co-orbital with Janus and Epimetheus when we think this is caused by meteoroid strikes on the surface, other small space rocks hitting either Janus or Epimetheus and ejecting more material into this faint ring that's associated with them. And their position just outside the A ring makes them shepherd moons corralling the outer edge of the A-ring to not grow any further. Otherwise, uh, material would start to get perturbed by the gravity of these two, giving it a kick. A couple of lovely photographs here of uh, Janus very close to Saturn's rings and a little bit further away with the moon Tethys, the much larger moon of Saturn, also visible in the right-hand image there. So, thanks very much for listening. That was Janus and Epimetheus, the co-orbital moons of Saturn. Thanks for listening.